Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. I'm sitting here all by myself in the recording studio, but with me as usual from his house is Scott Hemingway. Say hello, Scott. Tonight on location, Point Dexter. Yeah, so you're on location, Scott. Why are, why are you on location? Well, I seem to be a little under the weather, Uh-oh. which in this uh, world we're living in currently is uh, it's a thing to be concerned about. It definitely is a thing to be yeah. concerned about. Yeah, like I'm not I'm not feeling too bad at all. I feel pretty good today, but um, yeah, the second you get you get a little bit of a a cough or headache and you had a uh, fever, fever, you said, yeah. Yeah, a little bit of a fever and so you, you know, I do all the investigating, do all the uh, digging and calling who I need to call and you're told unless it's a serious respiratory issue, don't go to the hospital and take up the resources, which totally, totally understand. And, uh, but you self quarantine for 14 days. And so, uh, here I am. There you go. Self quarantined. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the dark poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of curious cast. It's affiliate global news, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some Dark Poutine. Chomp, chomp. <laughs> We start with talking about Crime Con, but uh, yeah, my yeah. I, my gut is telling me. Yeah, they haven't called it off. They're going to wait until April first. So yeah. at least that's what they've said so far. We'll see. I just I, I sadly don't see this uh, blowing over by, by that, that date, no. and uh, you know, yeah. But yeah. Um, hopefully it goes, or hopefully everything is is done and declared by them. But I doubt it. But uh, I'm sure it'll if if anything happens, it'll just get postponed and moved, and we'll yep. all get to uh, join each other and have a great time at some point. Exactly. So if you want to join the Yumber Yard, our Facebook group, that is COVID nineteen free. You cannot get it there. It's impossible. <laughs> Also, I created a Yumber Yard Discord room. If you're in the Yumber Yard, you can see an announcement there about it, and you can join our Discord room. I was chatting with some of our fans the other night. Um, hmm. Yeah, yes. doing some voice chat, and there's text chat in there too. People are talking about, you know, the usual things. I'm not familiar with this Discord. I must uh, must investigate. You must investigate. People are feeling particularly anxious and depressed with the constant barrage of disheartening news about COVID-19, I'm sure. Yep. So listeners who feel they are in crisis can contact the crisis text line in Canada by texting HOME to 686868 or in the US or UK text 741741. You'll be matched with a volunteer counselor who is supervised by a licensed trained mental health professional. Crisis Text Line is free, 24-7 support for those in crisis. And for more information, please go to crisistextline.ca in Canada or crisistextline.org globally. Reaching out for help is incredibly hard, but take it from Mike and myself. It, it's worth it. 
So let's get on with this show. We'll see how this goes. It's a scheduled away game. So I was thinking, what can I do within an away game at this point in time? Probably the bubonic plague isn't the best thing to do. <laughs> no, it's not going to alleviate anybody's anxiety. No, I didn't think that it would. Um, also, I thought, mm, torture, torture devices? devices. No, 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 that's that's not something that people would really enjoy. <laughs> And all of it kind of led back to things being dead. And I just thought, you know what? I don't want to talk about something dead or dying or anything like that this week. Yeah, d death is something looming on all of our minds exactly. currently. So well, I think we've had enough death. What I've chosen is it's a bit of lighter fare. At least I hope it's lighter. There will be some darker moments as well. As always, listener discretion is advised. However, this week, to paraphrase the sign near the entrance to the underworld in Dante's Divine Comedy, abandon hope, all ye who enter here. Ooh. Also, this is pretty nerdy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't have to read, do I? No, you don't have to read oh, it all. Phew. Okay, not that nerdy. This is episode 117, Hollow Earth, Fact or Fiction? <laughs> Do you want me to answer right now? You can I'm if you more like. Than, I'm more than prepared. Fiction. Okay. Quackery. <laughs> it's quackery? Yeah. All right. Before we get too deeply into the hollow earth, uh, see what I did there? Deep into uh -huh. the hollow uh -huh. earth. Uh -huh. It's uh -huh. important to touch on the recent resurgent of another wacky theory, that of the flat earth. Oh, because these are two sake. different things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Another thing that you really enjoy uh, oh, God. We've heard lots of talk recently about people who believe the Earth is flat, completely ignoring long-established scientific facts, claiming we are all being lied to. Yeah, yeah. Flat yeah. Earthers are vehement that the Earth is flat and are weird and somewhat crazy bunch, willing to go to great lengths to, quote, prove their theories. Without actually having ever proven it. Right. Well, mm -hmm. recently, on February 22nd, 2020, Michael J. Hughes, also known as Mad Mike, a flat earther and daredevil, was killed yep. in a stunt that he claimed would lead to proof the earth was flat. It, it did not. No. And in fact, what did it lead to, Mike? It led to his death. His eventual goal was to reach the Carmen Line, 100 kilometers or 62 miles above sea level. And that's considered by some the beginnings of space. However, that Saturday, he was attempting a more modest goal of 1,500 meters or 5,000 feet. But even this was too much when his parachute failed to open properly, according to iflscience.com. Mm. Yeah, not to be insensitive, but the only thing Mad Mike seemed to prove that day is that gravity is a thing. And leave some things to the professionals. <laughs> yeah. The filmmakers who were making a film about Hughes quoted the late, great Carl Sagan in their obituary post to Mad Mike on their Instagram. And Sagan said, we should confront ignorance with kindness. What? That's pretty interesting. Some pretty, that, pretty awesome advice from yeah. a pretty cool guy. Yeah. You know, and I will say as much as I like to ridicule flat earthers. Yeah. Uh, I did want them. Mean, there's a great Netflix documentary on there, which really kind of did a great job yeah. at uh, humanizing them because are they wrong? Absolutely. Are they making idiots of themselves? Absolutely. But the movie did a great job at actually just portraying, you know what? They're just people looking for somewhere to belong. So, you know, I, I do have a lot of empathy and I can understand that want to be a part, want to be a part of something. Mm -hmm. and, and that's all they're trying to do is just trying to be a part of something. Sadly, that something is quackery. Oh, well, they can't all be winners, right? They can't. No, no, no. But I don't know. Maybe there's another club called science that you can join. There is that. Yeah. But meh. but this, this one, Hollow Earth, seems even crazier. <laughs> Okay. Uh, like our recent homicidal sleepwalking episode, there was so much information to look through on this topic. I kind of lost myself among all kinds of craziness, some of which has been presented by even scientists over the years. Oh. This will be a brief overview of the subject, a drive-by, as our podcaster friend and host of Mile Marker 181, Emily Nestor, calls a one-off of a much <laughs> deeper subject. So, Yeah. A much deeper subject, see? I did it again. Oh, yeah, Hollow you Earth did, and Mike. Deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well done. In a nutshell, Hollow Earth theory comes from ancient legends of many cultures that say there are not only races of people, but entire civilizations that have existed underground for millennia. Wow. Okay. Um, can I ask something 
right off the bat. Here. Absolutely, go ahead. Because I, because I ha- I may have stories, personal stories uh, around it. Is one of the beliefs um, of a race of lizard people who live underground? It could be. I don't get into it that okay, deeply, okay, but okay. Uh, yeah. If you want to talk about lizard people, we can at the end of the show. Yeah, maybe because I do have a fascinating story around that. So okay, of my my time living with the lizard people. Many believers claim that these subterranean dwellers have technology beyond our understanding and have advanced much further politically and spiritually. It could be that UFOs and gray aliens experienced by those who have had close encounters are actually from inside the hollow earth come to study us. Some ho- <laughs> Some people believe that places like the Sahara and Gobi deserts exist because there were wars there that decimated these once lush areas and drove the beings who lived there underground in ancient times. Okay, but they could have also just gone to other places on earth where... It wasn't a desert. For eons, there have been myths and legends in numerous cultures sharing similar fables about another world beneath our feet. From NorseMythology.org, in Old Norse literature, the home of the dwarves is called Nidalvalir, meaning low fields or dark fields, or Svart Alfheim, meaning home of the black elves. The dwarves are master smiths and craftsmen who live beneath the ground. Accordingly, this place was probably thought of as a labyrinthine subterranean complex of mines and forges. I, I want to believe this sounds like a like the ghost of David Bowie lives there. <laughs> it also sounds familiar to me because I'm a World of Warcraft player. Mm. Some some people will recognize some of these elements as used in Iron Forge, which is the home of the dwarven race who are known for their crafting. And uh, also in the Molten Core raid. Exactly. <laughs> you have no idea what I'm talking about. It sounds to me like that was Lord of the Rings you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I kind of like the idea of a group of hardy, crafty Scandinavian folks of shorter stature making things underground. I don't know about uh, you. Sounds great. Often the myths are much darker, though. There's the Greek underworld, according to GreekMythology.net. Hidden deep within the bowels of the earth and ruled by the god Hades and his wife Persephone, the underworld was the kingdom of the dead in Greek mythology, the sunless place where the souls of those who died went after death. Sounds lovely. It does sound lovely. (laughs) Not really. (laughs) No, not at all. No. It doesn't say whether you had to be good or bad to go to the Greek underworld. I think you just went. Just do whatever the hell you want, because there's only one place to go after. Exactly. But Sweet. Jewish mythology had Sheol, and from oh. BibleStudyTools.net, a site that I would probably never go to again, <laughs> the Hebrew word Sheol refers to the grave or the abode of the dead. Through much of the Old Testament period, it was believed that all went to one place, whether human or animal, whether righteous or wicked. No one could avoid Sheol, which was thought to be down in the lowest parts of the earth. Oh, yeah, that's called Newton. (laughs) No? (laughs) No, that's where we live. Oh, shit! (laughs) Yeah. Uh, This... To keep practitioners in line, major religions later added post-life suffering to their ideas of the afterlife. For those who didn't behave in this life. This underworld is commonly called Hell. From Britannica.com, in its archaic sense, the term Hell refers to the underworld, a deep pit or distant land of shadows where the dead are gathered. From the underworld come dreams, ghosts, and demons, and in its most terrible precincts, sinners pay, some say eternally, the penalty for their crimes. The underworld is often imagined as a place of punishment rather than merely of darkness and decomposition because of the widespread belief that a moral universe requires judgment and retribution. Crime must not pay. So it's essentially prison for the dead. Pretty much. Yeah. 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 Uh, We'll dedicate an entire way game, I think, to hell at some point (laughs) because it definitely (laughs) deserves its own episode. You might say, what does this have to do with Hollow Earth? But this is where people's ideas stemmed from. 
fiction writers have used the Hollow Earth theories as a jumping off place for multiple wild and wonderful stories, some of which have been made into films or other media. In 1914, Edgar Rice Burroughs, author of Tarzan, wrote his novel At the Earth's Core. Hmm. The summary goes, quote, David Innes is a young man who just inherited a large mining company. Whoa. An eccentric inventor, Abner Perry, convinces Innes to underwrite a project and build a, quote, iron mole, claiming it will make them both wealthy. The mechanical beast works well, actually too well. On the maiden voyage, instead of digging a few minutes and returning, they plunge straight through the Earth's crust into the inner world of Pelucidar. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Pelucidar. <laughs> this world resembles Earth, but is hors horizonless, primeval tropical landscape where sun neither sets nor rises, and it is populated by Sagoth, gorilla men, wild human slaves, and the ruling hypnotic reptilian Mahors. Ah. There you there go. go. There we go. There's your yes. reptilian people, Scott. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. uh, there's a guy, David Icke, who has made a fortune off of uh, uh, convincing people that these lizard people who live underground, mm -hmm. that they're actually the ones in control like of Bill, the world. Bill Clinton. Cut, cut. Yeah, kind of like in the, the the TV series V, like they wear they they wear fake skin to look like humans. Yeah, and they what they feed off of is our negativity, so they must be fucking full right now. But there's a lot of people, a lot of people, who believe yeah. in pe lizard men people. living underground. L we don't want to genderize; they're lizard people, Scott. But the most famous fictional work was the 1864 publication of Jules Verne's novel, Journey to the Center oh, of the Earth. Love it. The summary of that goes, quote, Professor Von Hardwig and his nephew Harry discover the entrance to an ancient volcanic tunnel in Iceland. They choose to explore it for the mysteries that it may hold, the professor for scientific knowledge, and Harry to prove his bravery to a beautiful girl. Isn't it always about, about that? It is. Uh, as it should be. It is a dangerous journey that may destroy them both. As they travel deep into the caverns, they encounter a subterranean world that pre-existed man. It is an adventure as fascinating and strange as any explorer ever recorded. Finally, with their equipment lost and food running low, they must face the consequences of a vital choice. Attempt returning to the world above or explore even deeper mysteries in hopes of rescue. End quote. Do you know what the, the biggest find they made while down there? Uh, what? Bjork. <laughs> they found Bjork in Iceland? Yep, oh, well, they they, found. that's where she's from. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Was she wearing so. her swan outfit? <laughs> no, it was a goose. Oh, she was a wearing goose. a goose. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, she was working towards the swan outfit. And well, so this reminds me of the Saturday morning's live action sort of uh, stop motion animation show by Sid and Marty Croft. Yeah. Called, you mentioned it. Yeah, yeah, it's called Land of the Lost. Now, you and Carol claim not to remember that one. You sent like the opening to it, and I can't recall it. Uh, wow. But I mean, as, a, as obsessed with television as I have been my whole life, I'm sure I must have seen it. But no, it wasn't ringing a bell. Wow, that's that's weird. Yeah. Um, I thought all Canadian kids watched that. I guess we'll have some feedback from our, our listeners about it. Yeah. But uh, from the Land of the Lost wiki, here's sort of the plot of the story. The Land of the Lost series details the adventures of the Marshall family. Rick Marshall and his children, Will and Holly Marshall, get trapped in an alternate pocket universe after plunging through a dimensional portal while on a family rafting trip. I mean, that sounds so familiar. The land is inhabited by, well, Will Ferrell did a movie uh, recently. No, that. for sure. Yeah. Which I've watched. Yeah. The land is inhabited by dinosaurs, inquisitive, primitive type people called the Pakuni and aggressive insect lizard humanoids called Sleestack. Sleestack, I've heard. Well, I, that that instantly is like, ding, ding, ding. I must have seen this. The storyline focuses on the family's effort to survive in a hostile environment 
unravel the mystery of the land itself, and most importantly, to find their way back home. And the intro for the show is one of the best parts. I've already sent it to you, but I'll play it here for our listeners. Please, a piece please of it. Do. Yeah. Marshall, Will, and Holly on a routine expedition at the greatest earthquake ever known. High on the rapids, they struck their tiny raft. Watch full episodes of this show on YouTube. Um, they'll be taken down at some point because I don't think they're licensed. I'm pretty sure you could remake this entire show with an iPhone 4. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite 20th century horror authors, H.P. Lovecraft, wrote about an underworld as well from H.P. Lovecraft Wiki. The underworld is a subterranean region that runs beneath the whole of the dreamlands. Its principal inhabitants are ghouls who can physically enter the waking world through crypts. The underworld is also home to the Gugs, monstrous giants banished from the surface for untold blasphemies. The underworld's deepest realm is the Vale of Panath, a dangerous, lightless chasm inhabited by enormous unseen beasts called Beholes. Beholes are likely the ancestors of the Deholes of Yadith. There's a lot of oles there. Well, it's B-H-O-L-E-S, so I think he might have just been avoiding saying the word buttholes. <laughs> How can I say buttholes but yet not? To all you Lovecraft fans out there, Cthulhu Fatogan. Yeah. <laughs> Scott, you're, you're not a Lovecraft fan, I guess. I know what Cthulhu, Cthulhu is. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, but not, but not the but not the Guten Tagen part. No, Cthulhu Fatagen is Cthulhu yeah. Awakens, essentially. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So far, we've talked about mythological and fictional accounts that have alluded to a hollow earth. I can understand all these things as allegories, but there are those who believe the idea that the earth is hollow to be, in fact, a literal thing. In a Wired.com article on hollow earth called Fantastically Wrong... <laughs> Matt Simon wrote, quote, a German named Athanasius Kircher published what? Mundus Subterranus in 1664, in which he claimed the earth contains a central fire, kind of true really, and vast underground lakes and lava chambers. At the North Pole is a gaping vortex that sucks water down into the central fire where it is heated and expelled out of the South Pole much to the delight of the penguins there, I'd imagine, Un end quote. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I'll give people in the 1600s a pass for <laughs> believing this because, I mean, they didn't, the internet wasn't so fast back then. No, it was pretty, it, it, it was, it, it was even worse than dial-up. <laughs> the, the, the scientific tools we have at our beck and call now weren't so much around in 1600. <laughs> so I'll give, I'll give these fellas a pass. Well, we probably should. I mean, you yeah. know, there are, Boy, I imagine the kind of like things I would have thought up as fact if I was around in 1600. Well, Simon goes on to say that Kircher had zero science evidence to back up his claims. <laughs> but our next hollow earther was a well-known scientist and contemporary to Sir Isaac Newton. Oh. And this was Sir Edmund Haley. Do you know who was that it? is? No, it's Comet. Yeah, exactly. He yeah. is the discoverer of Halley's Comet in 1682. Yeah. He also built a diving bell that allowed he and five other brave souls to go 18 meters under the Thames River for an hour and a half in 1691. What? So perhaps it was the lasting effects of a lack of oxygen to his brain <laughs> that led him to put forth the idea that the earth was hollow in a 1692 paper called, quote, an account of the cause of the change of the variation of the magnetic needle with an hypothesis of the structure of the internal parts of the earth. I don't even, what was that called? <laughs> an account of the cause of the change of the variation of the magnetic needle with an hypothesis of the structure of the internal parts of the earth. 
So you just throw enough words together that <laughs> sound significant, right? And la- layman's like me, you're like, sure, that's I'm, it. Sounds, sounds like re- sounds like research was done exactly. Uh, Dr. Gregory L. Reese's book, Weird Science and Bizarre Beliefs, summed up Haley's article saying, Haley's, quote, theory of the Earth's inner structure was meant to solve the problem of the motion of the magnetic poles. His solution to the problem was quite ingenious. We must suppose, he said, that the Earth is composed of three parts. The outer shell, with which we are so familiar, an inner globe or nucleus, and a fluid medium in between. If we further examine that both the inner and outer globe are turning around a common center and axis of rotation, but slightly out of sync with one another, that is, with one turning slightly faster than the other, we can discover a solution to the problem of the motion of the magnetic poles. I don't know how it was a problem, <laughs> but I mean, there, there, there's some fact to what they're saying. I mean, they at least got the part right that there are layers to the earth and, you know, layers with different consistencies to it. So well done, fellas. You got that right. Well, that's Haley. It gets a little weirder, though. He also wrote that the northern lights, the aurora borealis, and southern lights, the aurora australis, were co- Earth's farts? No, they were caused by a leakage of the liquid between the inner spheres at the poles where the crust between our world and the one beneath are thinnest. That's what I'm going to start saying when I fart okay. to, my ki- to my kids. That yeah, It's Aurora Borealis? It's Aurora Borealis. I'm, pr- I'm, I'm blessing you all with Aurora Borealis from my bum. <laughs> the reason that we see light due to this is because the inner liquid glows to give light to the creatures that live in that realm. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah, it gets worse. I mean, I mean, that's some creative thinking. It's pretty wacky reading. <laughs> and as I'm not a mathematician, nor do I have access to the geographical locations or equipment that he used, I wasn't able to check Haley's work. Uh, we'll have a link in our show notes so you can check it out for yourself. Perhaps one of you wise listeners will prove him correct. Who knows, but his theory was poo-pooed by other scientists in that era anyway. Well. And we'll take a break right here and come back and we'll get to the beliefs and supposed expeditions of a few hollow earthers. Oh God, yes. Expeditions, Scott. You had me at an expedition. And we're back. Are you a hollow earth believer yet, Scott? You know, th- there was some pretty uh, profound evidence provided, but no. <laughs> it's a hard no. I didn't even find it no. was profound at all, but anyway. Well, can't refute those big scientific words, Mike. In 1818, John Cleves Sims Jr., an American army officer, announced his hollow earth theory to the world by way of a document that is now called Sim Circular Number 1. Oh, oh. I, I mean, I'm well aware of Sim Circular number three. Oh, yeah. Are you? That was a catchy song a couple of years ago. It was the B-side to something. I can't remember. Yeah. Well, Sim said that the Earth consisted of a hollow shell about 800 miles or 1,300 kilometers thick with openings about 1,400 miles across, 2,300 kilometers, at both poles with four inner shells each open at the poles. His circular declared his truth and called on others to accompany him on an expedition into the holes in the poles. That sounded like some pretty gigantic holes. Yeah, they're pretty big holes. He wanted to start in the north as access to that one might be easier because he lived in the northern hemisphere. Yeah, makes sense. Here's a bit from his circular number one, and it, was, it says, Light gives light to light. Discover ad infinitum. St. Louis, Missouri Territory, North America, April 10th, A.D. 1818. To all the world, I declare the earth is hollow and inhabitable within, containing a number of solid, concentric spheres, one within the other, and that it is open at the poles, 12 or 16 degrees. I pledge my life in support of this truth and am ready to explore the hollow if the world will support and aid me in the undertaking. Signed, Cleveland Sims of Ohio, late captain of infantry. I have ready for the press a treatise on the principles of matter wherein I show the proofs of the above positions, account for the various phenomena, and disclose Dr. Darwin's golden secret. My terms are the patronage of this and the new world's 
I dedicate to my wife and her ten children. I select Dr. S. L. Mitchell, Dr. L. Darcy, and Baron X. de Humboldt as my protectors. I ask one hundred brave companions well equipped to start from Siberia in the fall season with reindeer and sleighs on the ice of the frozen sea. I engage we will find warm and rich land stocked with thrifty vegetables and animals if not men on reaching one degree northward of latitude 82. We will return in the succeeding spring. JCS. So he, so essentially he wanted funds. Yeah, he wanted money. So, I mean, maybe this was the early version of Enron. I love how he thinks that it's like this utopia underground. They're full of food and, and all these great things. Because when I think of underground, I think of dank caves. Like dirt. With with stalagmites all over the place. Um, the odd worm and maybe a bat. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Not a plentiful food or the the movie the descent oh yeah that's a surprisingly good movie yeah there were very few who wanted any kind of involvement in a suicide mission to the north pole <laughs> uh, yeah. in that day it was like a mission to jupiter to put things in context sir john franklin was still 25 years away from his ill-fated expedition e. yeah so we're well aware how that turned out but we know that John Franklin did not fall into a giant hole in the ice. And and he was he was just looking for things on the earth. Right. Uh, imagine now that plus in the earth. Well, in 1820 a novel was published called Simsonia, Voyage of Discovery, Simsonia. Hmm. Simsonia. Yeah, written by an author calling himself Captain Adam Seaborn. The novel is the story of a fantastical journey by sea into the hole in the North Pole. Some speculated that Sims was the author and that he had, in fact, completed his expedition. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Well, from Dr. Gregory L. Reese's book, Weird Science and Bizarre Beliefs, quote, After passing through the Arctic Circle into a tropically warm polar climate, the adventurers enter the hollow earth, the inhabitants of the Earth's core are humanoid and described as gentle vegetarians. They reject material possessions in favor of the wealth of the soul. Because of their virtuous nature, the internals possess great intelligence and have very little need for sleep. They are extremely attractive with beautiful white skin. They also wow. have... <laughs> They also have great physical strength. The government is democratic and women are granted equal status with men. In many ways, they seem to exist in a Garden of Eden like the humanity before the fall from grace. Boy, they're woke. <laughs> <laughs> That's very woke. My God. Let's go. Yeah, exactly. This, sound, this sounds great. Well, I don't know about the beautiful white skin. I kind of like a little, you know, variety in my world. But uh, oh, well, but we're going to go bring some culture with us. I guess so. But we're, maybe we're maybe their skin is white because they're underground and there's no actual well, light. I think it had that the pigmentation is related to uh, never seen sun. <laughs> it could be. Yeah. Sims believed in hollow earth for the rest of his life and lectured widely on the topic until his death in 1829. That's only 11 years later. Uh, according to Atlas Obscura, after the rigors of lecture circuit took their toll, Sims retired to Hamilton, Ohio, where he would eventually pass away in 1829. One of Sims acolytes, Jeremiah Reynolds, continued the hollow earth cause for a time, even finding a ship to take him to Antarctica in search of one of the entrances to the inner earth. Nothing was ever found. Sims is remembered by a monument in Hamilton, Ohio's Ludlow Park, which features an abstract hollow earth atop a stone pedestal and a plaque that explains his theory. Quackery or not, Sims sci-fi theories will not be forgotten anytime soon, end quote. For entertainment purposes, these are fantastic. Yeah, right? They, this, they, they're, they have been movies, and I would love to see better versions of those movies. And here's the thing. Like, the more I learn about the, the Hollow Earth stuff, the more interesting it gets. Like, it's pretty weird and, and kind of kooky stuff, but it's it's pretty fascinating science fiction. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Our next wackadoo is, Char <laughs> <laughs> is Charles Reed Teed. Yes, that's his real name. Charles Reed Teed. 
Read Teed. Yeah. Wow. Teed was a cult leader an alchemist from the 1800s who had a compound on 3800 Corkscrew Road in an American town called Estero. You'll never oh. guess what state this was in, Scott. Oh, God. Uh, uh, Texas. Florida. Oh, God. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Teed was an eclectic physician, and that's the late 1800s version of Karen from Facebook who thinks yoga... <laughs> Yoga and unabashed farting and lavender oils are going to cure cancer. <laughs> he loved to tinker with electricity and was known to carry out dangerous high-voltage experiments. Whoa. From the Wikipedia article on Teed, quote, In the autumn of 1869, during an experiment, he was badly shocked and passed out. During his period of unconsciousness, Teed believed he was visited by a divine spirit who told him that he was the Messiah— Inspired, once he awoke, Teed vowed to apply his scientific knowledge to redeem humanity. He promptly changed his first name to Koresh, the Hebrew version of Cyrus. Did he start to sell uh, buckets of food? No. Over the uh, internet? No, but K oh. Koresh is a little familiar, correct? Very, Dave Koresh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, after he was zapped, Teed turned the flat earth idea on his head. His belief was that we who are living now are on the inside of the surface of a sphere. He wrote, oh. earth is the cosmos. It is indeed spherical, yet humankind does not live on the outside shell of this ball. We live our lives upon the inside surface. All existence is contained within, outside the rind or outermost shell. There exists nothing. There is only void. Wow. Okay. I think my concept of circles has been wrong my whole life. <laughs> well, he went on to write, there are 17 lamini or layered shells to the physical limitation of our universe. Altogether, they are approximately 100 miles thick. There are five geologic laminae, of which the innermost is the surface of our familiar Earth. We exist on its concave surface. It curves upward eight inches to the mile. Thus, the diameter and circumference of our universe are, respectively, 8,000 and 25,000 miles. Okay, so, could you imagine poor fellows like this guy, who I'm sure thought that this like they figured it out oh yeah they, they they what they have discovered like this is fact this is truth you're all fools for not believing it could you imagine that poor guy hops in a time machine comes to the future and just like spends a bit of time on google and it's just like oh for fuck's sake well i can tell you one thing he probably would have, have uh, changed his name from koresh because oh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it's just like they would come to the future now and just be like, my God, was I ever wrong? <laughs> like very quickly, they would realize like, holy, I'm embarrassed <laughs> that I think that. Well, it gets better. Great. The sun, he said, was actually the core of our world. Quote, okay. right. a solar electromagnetic atmosphere called the solar limbus, which has at its center the stellar nucleus, a true yet directly unobservable sun. The sun we daily perceive, along with all the other observable astronomical bodies, are actually a variety of reflections stemming from this true sun. <sighs> Holy crap. According to Matt Simon's Wired article, on a beach near their commune for five months, the Koreshanites deployed a rectilineator, a device of their own creation. Exactly. <laughs> a device of their own creation to scientifically measure that the earth is in fact concave. And naturally it was a success, end quote. Oh, okay. So well. their, their name that I'm not going to try and pronounce again worked. <laughs> well, whatever the hell that thing was. <laughs> Seems legit, right? I could just make up an instrument to do something and then say it did it. And how could you prove me wrong? So this guy's 250 followers were called Koreshans, and he was King Koresh. The 69-year-old cult leader died on December 22nd, 1908, after being severely beaten, trying to... Oh. <laughs> oh, what? He... Plot twist? Wow. Yeah, he was trying to break up a fight in front of a grocery store between a group of Koreshans and angry locals tired of hearing their bizarre prophecies. <laughs> 
when he failed to be resurrected, as he had claimed in his book, The Immortal Manhood, the oh, group no. fell apart. <laughs> That'll happen. That'll happen. Yeah. According to findagrave.com, quote, his tomb was washed away in the hurricane of 1910 and no longer <laughs> exists. Jesus. Apparently his casket was washed out to sea. Wow. Just like this. this <laughs> he couldn't win. This guy. Yeah, he couldn't win. No. In 1906, William Reed published his book, Phantom of the Poles, whipping up more interest in the hollow earth theories. According, I watched that movie, by the way. Oh, Phantom of the Poles? Yeah. No, that pretty, I think that's like It's a, pretty racy. It's pornography. <laughs> According to sacredtexts.com, the book, quote, presents a collection of reports of polar explorers on strange and unexplained phenomena, such as warm winds, deposits of dust, rocks embedded in icebergs, large ice-free areas, freshwater areas in the open polar ocean, and bizarre auroras, all in support of his belief that the polar areas are the vestibule to the interior of the hollow earth. Reed believed that the poles were unreachable because they simply didn't exist. Wow. But that's where the holes are. Well, yeah. But what he was saying is that the the barber pole that is in all the Santa Claus movies wasn't there. No, it's there. I believe it. I believe it's there. In the 12th and final chapter of his book, Reed attempts to answer the question, what is in the interior of the earth? Oh. Do you want to try and answer that question yourself, Scott? Yep. Um, Dirt. Uh, it, it's, no, no, no. It's like a Dairy Queen ice cream cake. Oh. Uh, you have kind of an Oreo middle layer. Oh. Yep. With delicious, delicious uh, ice cream on the bottom. Oh. And then, then you've got your Oreo layer. And then you've got kind of a more chocolatey layer which is a, a delicious layer sprinkled with some other uh, Oreo bits of, of, on the top and some icing. And then the and dirt? I, the, I, the icing is the mountains because oh. it's, it's, it's very coarse and, you know, rigid. And, uh, yeah, the, well, the, the ground up Oreo bits are the dirt that you get to eat. And oh. so, yeah. Well, am I right? No. Oh. So how Reed answered the question, what is in the interior of the earth? He wrote... That, of course, is speculative based on the little evidence found on Earth. It is not like the question, is the Earth hollow? We know that it is, but oh. do not know what will be found in its interior. It is like seeing an island far off. We know that there is land, but we do not know what it is like until we get there. So many circumstances show the Earth is hollow that the fact cannot be questioned. But its contents are not so easily determined till we look inside. From what I am able to gather and from analysis, game of all kinds, tropical and arctic, will be found there. Both warm and cold climates must be in the interior, warm inland and cold near the poles. Sea monsters, and possibly the much talk of, talked of sea serpent, may also be found in vast territories of arable land for farming purposes. What do you think the sea serpent could be, Scott? Um, Okopogo? Exactly. That's what I thought, oh, too, when I wrote yeah. it, when I read that. That's yeah, well, it's, it, you've got, he's got an Ogopogo farm. <laughs> or something. He's, where he's farming more Ogopogos. It it's could be. Pretty, it's a, yeah, yeah, that seems legit. Uh, the following story is probably the nuttiest one of this entire episode. That's, that says a lot. But this guy was a real guy, like Richard Evelyn Bird Jr. And that's his real name too. It's Bird is spelled B-Y-R-D, not like Bird. Oh, that Bird. makes it better. That makes yeah. it less hilarious. So he was a rear admiral in the United States Navy who had served in World War I. And then I was in World... <laughs> What's that? I was, a, I was a front admiral. Oh, okay. And then he served in World War II where he became confidential advisor to the Commander-in-Chief United States Fleet and Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Ernest J. King. So this guy had some power. He had a, he had a significant role in clout there. Well, he definitely did. He was present when the Japanese surrendered on September 2nd, 1945. Son of a bitch. He retired from service with multiple decorations, including the Medal of Honor, Navy Cross, Navy Distinguished Service Medal, Distinguished Flying Cross, Legion of Merit, and Congressional Gold Medal. Well, Bird's the real deal. He is the real deal. 
He was also a well-known explorer, and this is where he got most of his honors. He was awarded his Medal of Honor for claiming with his co-pilot Floyd Bennett that they had flown to the North Pole and back in 1926. Wait a minute. Yeah? Are there a lot of refueling stations in the North Pole? Well, here's the thing. The claims Uh. about the success of this flight have been disputed, but we don't have enough time to fully examine (laughs) Because we could get into it, but that would take us way off in the tangent. Yeah. And that this whole episode is about tangents, weirdly. Yeah. Uh, in 1927, he completed a transatlantic flight after Lindbergh completed his. But oh. he still earned the Distinguished Flying Cross for that. So he got medals for just flying his plane all over the place. Huh. Bird also participated in a number of other expeditions to Antarctica and the North Pole. Now, here's where it gets odd. A text that some claim to be the secret diary of Admiral Byrd emerged in the years after his death in 1957. It details chronologically a flight of Admiral Byrd's over the South Pole made on February 2nd, 1947. Okay, I'm, I'm ready. Okay, so they took off from their base camp at 610 in the morning. Okay. Many of the next dozen entries or so... Uh, taking place every few minutes, seemed to be a routine mentioning of oil leaks, turbulence, altitudes, radio check-ins with the base, adjustments to their plane, and descriptions of white snow stretching as far as the eye can see. Sounds normal sure. so far, right? Yeah, absolutely. At 9.10 in the morning. So three hours, approximately yep. three hours later. Yep. This entry reads, quote, vast ice and snow below, note coloration of yellow nature and disperse in a linear pattern. What the f- what hell does that mean? Well, you know what they say, watch out where the huskies go and don't you eat that yellow snow. <laughs> well, that, that's what Frank Zappa told us anyway. Yeah, which is, is really great advice. He altered course for a better examination of this coloration pattern below. I'd say. Uh, it became reddish and purple also. He circled this area for two full turns and assigned a compass heading, position check made again to base camp to let him know that where they were yeah. and he relayed information concerning the colorations of the ice and snow below so it was very weird also at 9:10, the magnetic and gyro compasses began to gyrate and wobble very whoa. weirdly whoa yeah so he was unable to hold his heading by instrumentation and he had to take his bearing with sun compass but all seems well like he could still fly the plane just great yep yeah. The controls, though, were sluggish and slow to respond, but there was no indication of icing. Hmm, what's going on? A uh, peyote? <laughs> Could be. At 9.15 in the distance, he saw mountains. Okay. 9.49. 29 minutes elapsed flight time from the first sighting of the mountains. It is no illusion. There are mountains and consisting of a small range that I've never seen before. And at 9.55, altitude changed to 2,950 feet, encountering strong turbulence again. And it gets really bizarre here. 10 o'clock, we are crossing over small mountain range and still proceeding northward as best we can ascertain. Beyond the mountain range is what appears to be a valley with a small river or stream running through the center portion. There should be no green valley below. Something is definitely wrong and abnormal here. We should be over ice and snow. To the port side are great forests growing on the mountain slopes. Our navigation instruments are still spinning. The gyroscope is oscillating back and forth. You you don't want an oscillating gyroscope. No, that's the last thing. Trust me. Trust me. At 10.05, I alter altitude to 1,400 feet and execute a sharp left turn to better examine the valley below. It is green with either a moss or a type of tight-knit grass. The light here seems different. I cannot see sun anymore. We make another left turn and we spot what seems to be a large animal of some kind below us. This is in Antarctica. It appears to be an elephant. No! With three exclamation marks. It looks more like a mammoth. This is incredible. Yet there it is. Oh, I need to take a breath. Well, he decreases to a thousand feet to take out his binoculars and better examine the animal. Animal, Good. It is confirmed. It is definitely a mammoth-like animal. He reports this to base camp. Well, thank goodness the radio is still working. (laughs) 
At 10.30, he encounters more rolling green hills now. The external temperature indicator reads 74 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty warm. Yeah. Continuing on our heading now, navigation instruments seem normal. I am puzzled over their actions. Attempt to contact base camp. Radio is not functioning. Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. At 11.30, countryside below is more level and normal, if I may use that word. Ahead we (laughs) spot what seems to be a city. Good God. This is impossible. Aircraft seems light and oddly buoyant. The controls refuse to respond. My God! Three exclamation points. (laughs) He's really emphasizing these. Off our port and starboard wings are strange type of aircraft. They are rapidly closing alongside. They are disc shape and have a radiant quality to them. Oh my goodness. Well, you're going to be disturbed by these next things. They are close enough now to see the markings on them. It is a type of swastika. (laughs) This is fantastic. Where are we? What has happened? I tug at the controls again. They will not respond. Four exclamation points. Whoa. We are caught in an invisible vice grip of some type. I think he's experiencing a tractor beam, Scott. I think so. And, you know, as we've all wanted. At 11.35, our radio crackles and a voice comes through in English with what perhaps is a slight Nordic or Germanic accent. The message is, Welcome, Admiral, to our domain. We shall land you in exactly seven minutes. Relax, Admiral. You are in good hands. I I would totally be like, right on, and I'd lean back. (laughs) Would you? Hands hands crossed behind my head. Just, ah, yes. Land me. He continues. I note the engines of our plane have stopped running. The aircraft is under some strange control and is now turning itself. The controls are useless. At 1140, another radio message received. We begin the landing process now, and in moments the plane shudders slightly and begins a descent as though caught in some great unseen elevator. The downward motion is negligible, and we touch down with only a slight jolt. This is amazing. At 11.45, I am making a hasty last entry in the flight log. Several men are approaching on foot toward our aircraft. They are tall with blonde hair. In the distance is a large shimmering city with pulsating with rainbow hues of color. I do not know what is going to happen now. I see no signs of weapon on those approaching. I hear now a voice ordering me by name to open the cargo door. I comply. I don't know if I would have complied so easy. Well, well, the rainbow lights would make me be like, okay, this seems like a very LGBTQ friendly (laughs) Nazi group. Let's... (laughs) Let's see. Let's see what's out here. Swastikas and blonde hair, tall blonde men. Mm. See what they have to offer. Uh, He then goes on to, quote, write from memory about how he had and his radio man had been taken to a city made of crystal that looked like (laughs) something out of, quote, Buck Rogers. (laughs) Exactly. Bird was greeted as a hero from the surface world, and he and his companion are fed before they are granted an audience with, quote, the master. Whoa. (laughs) They're just like... Right? We, you've been here five minutes. Let's take you to the president of our Exactly. Nation. Because we know that that's what you need to do. You need to yeah. meet, meet the master. Yeah. Not like, what is this weird group of people who've landed? Let's quarantine them. He doesn't mention really what the master looks like. He says he's the good looking person who has the signs of age on him, but he looks a lot like the other folks. The master explains how they sent their flying machines, the Flugelrads, to to investigate the surface after the atomic explosion in Nagasaki. Mm. Apparently Mm. that concerned them. Yeah, well, of course, immediately you got to send up your (laughs) Flugelrads. The master told Bird, quote, The dark ages that will come now for your race will cover the earth like a pall. But I believe that some of your race will live through the storm. Beyond that, I cannot say. We see at a great distance a new world stirring from the ruins of your race, seeking its lost and legendary treasures, and they will be here, my son, safe in our keeping. When that time arrives, we shall come forward again to help revive your culture and your race. 
And after that, certain of your culture and science will be returned for your race to begin anew. You, my son, are to return to the surface world with this message. Wow. Wow. So, so. This, what, a, what a lucky person to have just been plucked. Well, he was an admiral, a rear admiral, Scott, so. Yeah, I know. You know, I, they want to take that's... somebody important. I'm in such disbelief for over all of this uh, right now. It's just, it's, it sounds beautiful. Aside, right. aside from the destruction of the outer world. And the Nazis. And, and the Nazi part. Yeah. Bird, Bird and the radio man returned to the surface and the Admiral raced to the Pentagon where he met with <laughs> officials to tell him. What I'm, he sure, I'm sure it went over great. Guys, guys, hold on a minute. I got something to tell you. Well, so the entry in this diary, it's on March 11th, 1947. So he writes about what had happened at the Pentagon. Quote, I have stated fully my discovery and the message from the master. All is duly recorded. The president has been advised. I am now detained for several hours, six hours, 39 minutes to be exact. Oh. I am interviewed intently by top security forces and a medical team. I'm sure that's what they were called, top security forces. Yeah. It yeah. was an ordeal. I am placed under strict control via the national security provisions of the United States of America. I am, and this is in all caps, ordered to remain silent in regard to all that I have learned on the behalf of humanity. Incredible. Must, must mean it's, they've taken a serious mic. Yeah. Well, so yeah. it. He is reminded that he was a military man and must obey orders. For, for sure. Absolutely. Bird apparently did follow orders and hid his knowledge from the public, taking it to the grave with him until this uh, diary, quote unquote, popped up. Well, that's tragic. Yeah. Well. That's tra you wish it, you, too bad. So we can't confirm nor deny that this was uh, exactly. his word. Oh. Yeah, he's gone, Scott. Oh, No. Well, we'll just have to take this book's word for it. Exactly. Some some have said it was the Russians who released the information against the wishes of the U.S. government, who continues to cover up the fact that a master race of alien Nazis are living in the whole <laughs> earth. And, uh, well, you know, what reasons would the Russians have to spread any kind of disinformation? I don't see that ever happening. You know, when you when you position it and phrase it as uh, alien Russian Nazis... Just it, it just all seems right. And I have written here, aliens, Russians, and Nazis. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> this is fantastical. Yeah. So I guess we'll end here with our, this, oh. will, this will be the end of our Hollow Earth episode. But uh, Well, I, can, I, can I tell my, my lizard people story? Yes, you can tell your lizard people story. So I had a, a neighbor... I lived in an apartment in New West. This would have been you know, roughly 20 years ago. And uh, yeah, so they firmly, there's two roommates. They firmly believed in these lizard people that live under earth. Um, they were big fans of David Icke, the guy who mm -hmm. pr propagates that quackery. But it was just such a bizarre thing to be just sitting there with somebody you'd like talking to somebody face to face and hearing them actually straight face talking to you about no no the world is controlled by lizard people who live underground but they are also wearing outfits and cut like so they look like humans and they're actually the presidents and the prime ministers and they run the government and um like it's just it's you're a fool you're the idiot for not believing that, Scott, because this is just how it is. And, and the two people, see, one of them you can be like, he's a little cuckoo. But two people, you're just like, you, you don't even know how to really respond to them. No. Because you're just like, because logic isn't going to, because you like, you just, you're like, no, that's not true. Uh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but we aren't being controlled by lizard people. Who, who live inside the earth. No. This hollow earth. No. And just their, their conviction, Mike. Oh my God. Their conviction to it was, <laughs> oh my. Like, I think that's I the would, most disturbing thing is, is, but I mean, we, we have ideas that I'm sure somebody thinks is crazy. Cool. But uh, <laughs> has nothing to do with lizard people right there. No, that's true. <laughs> like it's, I, what blew me away was like, you would think maybe they would be like, well, I kind of believe this. It sounds like, you know, they might be open to, you know, 
when you're because when you're talking lizard people are running this earth and live in, underground yeah you'd think at some point you, you'd be checking yourself like well that does i know it sounds ridiculous oh, but yeah. i believe it no no there wasn't an ounce of i know this sounds ridiculous it was no no you're ridiculous for not believing <laughs> us so they told you that you were the quack I was the quack and, and they were just like so many weird conversations with one person in particular, so many weird conversations. He was convinced that because part of this lizard people, there's a religion a belief system that goes around it. And he was like a few, there's levels to it. And once you reach this higher level, you can literally like, you just conjure up anything you want. He's like, if I, if I can reach that level, if I, if I thought to myself, I want a million dollars, boom, a million dollars will appear. And I'm just, I remember like, just like, you're just, you're not healthy, (laughs) but, but so, uh, you know, 20 years later or so at our former in a place of employment. Did, I go he, did he our, conjure up a million I, dollars in front of you? I go into the lunchroom at one point. Yep. Guess who I see there? Oh my this, God. This guy in our work lunchroom, uh, outbound calling sales group, the CSE group or whatever they were. He was working for them. So yeah, no, clearly he didn't conjure up his million dollars. No. Or maybe his, maybe his the goal he wanted was that job. I don't know. But yeah. Uh, and then he added me on Facebook, Mike. And just the stuff he would post. Pro-Hitler stuff. But like, he's also... Did uh, this guy work for me? <laughs> he's, he's also a Harry Krishna. It, he's a Harry Krishna who... He, he's a Harry Krishna... Who believes that hit that we, we've got the Hitler stuff? All, oh, anyways, I could go on for a while, but lizard people living underground, controlling us. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Quackery. Wow. So I just want to see if uh, you can hear our voicemails. I'm just going to start to play one. Sure. Just to see if you can hear it. Hello, wonderful human. I just wanted to take the time to say thank you for your wonderful podcast. Uh, my name is Elizabeth. I live in Toronto now, coming from, as you can tell, a French Canadian city. Um, I started listening to True Crime podcast when I moved to Toronto. And what a bad idea when you move to a, a, a basement apartment by yourself with only a cat. And so your, your podcast is the only one that I kept True Crime because you make me live all the emotion from anger to sadness, but you make me laugh as well. I really enjoy it. I think you're wonderful humans. You can say whatever you want, like absolutely or go shit in your hat, whatever that <laughs> means. I'm not judging if you like doing that. So have a th- thank you very much. That's only the, the only thing I wanted to say and um, continue your work we really appreciate it thank you goodbye Um, that was incredible i love that oddly uh one of my uh, good closest friends for like the last 25 years or so her name's elizabeth and she was from montreal oh wow yeah well it was (laughs) that was a really great voicemail thank you so much it it really was Uh, yeah i leave more you that was fantastic yep uh we need more more people who are uh who are positive and uh i love that accent like i know you know oh it's great people people think i'm making fun of people when i i do my accents i i i'm not i actually really do appreciate uh, these people's different way of of speaking and i yeah. i find the french canadian accent is is kind of musical to tell you the and, truth and i love that she does she's not judging us for sh- if for shitting in our hats well she shouldn't I mean, it was very, very, very uh, supportive. Exactly. So thank you so much. for. Yes, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, Scott and Mike. This is Allie from Virginia. And I just wanted to call and say thank you guys for your wonderful show. I found out about you guys through My Favorite Murder. And my friend Gabby and I, she's from Vancouver, are huge fans of you guys. And I really appreciate all the thought and the care you put into your show, especially talking about the lives and the histories of the victims, especially your recent work about um, missing Indigenous women and girls. And 
okay, well, I'm not supposed to cuss because I'm a school teacher, but, you know, go take a dookie in your hat. Bye. <laughs> well, thank you, Allie from Virginia. That's awesome. Yeah, thanks, Allie. We're all yeah. for dookie in our hats. I mean, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Especially if it's a dookie. You got you can tell us to do whatever you want in our in our hats, and we'll probably not do it. But uh <laughs> I feel uncomfortable with that. Well, yeah, you never know. Hi, Mike and Scott. This is Harry from Sacramento, sending you some California love from the first Californian PM. I don't know if that's true, but I would like to think so. The show continues to be fantastic. I wanted to thank you, Mike, personally, for being an inspiration to me. I always love to hear a fellow person in recovery doing well and showing the world that we can recover. Love you guys. Bye-bye. Oh, by the way, go shit in your hats. Well, thank you, <laughs> me, Harry. Yes, we know who you are very yes. well. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if you're the first prime minister from uh, California, Harry, but I can assure you, you're the first prime minister in my heart. Well, isn't that nice? Aww. Yeah, and I definitely appreciate the shout out to uh, recovering folks. And I know it's been hard for people lately, but we are making do with new ways of getting together, new technology. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So don't worry about us recovering folks. We're doing our, we're doing what we need to do to continue doing what we're doing. <laughs> but that's, that's beautiful to hear. Oh God. That was a real mouthful. It was doing a lot of doing of doing doings. There you go. So thank you all for your voicemails. You can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 877 darkptn That's one 877 Dark patin. Dark patin. If your call really stands out, you might hear it on the show. Yeah. Just know? like they did. Just like they did. Especially if you're nice, like uh, all of them. All of them. <laughs> I don't think we've had any nasty ones, which is good, except for that. Oh, no, we did have another French Canadian person, remember? And he actually. Oh, early cussed, on, I yeah, did. Yeah, he cussed us out in French. Tabernak. <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, uh, all right, so let's look at Patreon. So let's do some Patreon shout-outs, Scott. Yeah, let's. Let's do that. Um, like I say, uh, Patreon has been a little uh, light of late, but that's okay. We, we really, yeah. we really yeah. absolutely understand that everybody has uh, bigger fish to fry than, than helping yeah. a little old podcast. There's a little thing called a pandemic happening and yeah. a lot of people out of work. So yeah. absolutely understand. Yeah, we are fully. Uh, oh, here we have one from Melissa Olstrom. I don't know where oh. Melissa's from. Uh, Uzbekistan. Oh, she's from Uzbekistan. And what, yeah. does, what does she do in Uzbekistan? Uh, so what she does is she all by herself. Uh oh. Repaints, yeah, painted poles. So she repaints painted poles. Exactly. Are are you exactly. talking about Polish people? No, my oh, God, no. Okay, well, I'm just checking. You never no, good, know. No, it's good. It's good to always, always good to check, clarify and, yeah. and double check, Mike. No, no, well, just telephone poles. Ah, yeah. Um, why they need repainting? I'm I'm not too sure. Yeah. We don't question it. It keeps her busy though. Keeps yeah, her busy. Good. Lots. She she has she goes through a lot of ladders. Yeah, yeah. Next and poles up, are tall. <laughs> Next up, we have uh, Sarah Rotman, and she's from Anchorage, Alaska. Oh, I don't know why, but I've always wanted to to, to venture north to Alaska. Alaska. When they uh, hose off the cruise lines, I might actually take the inside passage <laughs> someday and do the Alaska cruise. That could be fun. They hose them off, yes. With yes. lots of bleach and... <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mary Jane Stenberg. I don't know where oh. Mary Jane's from. The Hamptons. Oh, she's from the Hamptons. Oh, does she know Chip and Buffy? <laughs> she does, yeah. Does, does, yeah. She does. Does Mary Jane Stenberg have a, have a room at the Yacht Club that she has her <laughs> special parties in? <laughs> you do know her. You sounds like you know her. You're describing oh my, her friends. Oh my goodness! It's just amazing. Do you know what she does? Oh, I, I'm pretty sure she's just a philanthropist or something. No, 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 no. When you hear this job description, you'll go, "Oh, now I know why she's in the Hamptons." Oh, fantastic! 
she's a money counter. I, I know they have those machines where yeah. you can just put your money in and it spits it up, but because it's the Hamptons, mm-hmm. no, no, they they want to hire people to actually just come to their home and then count to the money they have in their home. Oh, well, there you go. And I'm sure it's a lot of it. So she probably gets paid well. I guess what? You charge them an arm and a leg. Yeah. Oh. A literal arm and it's a leg. Very, it's very lucrative. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Next up, we have Lindsay Crocker, and she is from Toronto, Ontario. Ah, good old Toronto. Toronto. Thank where, you, where, Lindsay. Where the caller Elizabeth is now living in a basement terrified because of true crime podcasts. And here we have one from outside of my hometown. What? Her name is Brenda Plummer, and she is from Italy Cross, Nova Scotia, and that is very close to where I grew up. Wow. That's kind of cool. So thank you, Brenda Plummer. That's really Thank great. You. Yes, and, Brenda Plummer. Yeah, like I'm reading her address and I totally know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say that, obviously, because... I would recommend not. No. Yeah. Next up, we have somebody who calls herself Peace Cat, but oh. uh, but her name is actually Kathleen Madis- Madsen, and she is from Gravenhurst, Ontario. There's a whole bunch of great names involved there. Yeah, right? Peace Cat, Gravenhurst. Kathleen Madsen. Yeah. Uh, next we have Jen Segris and she is from Vancouver, British Columbia. I think I know where that is too. I've heard of it. I've (laughs) been there a couple of times. I feel like I have. No, I'm not, I'm not going to commit, but I feel like I've been there. And our last patron is Alexandra, Alexandria Thibodeau. And she is, she is from Thunder Bay. Oh, Thunder Bay, Ontario. Yeah, exactly. I drove yeah. through there when I went across oh, Canada. You? Yeah, I stopped there yeah. for overnight. And you weren't murdered? I stayed in a hostel. No, I was downtown. Uh, I mm-hmm. felt a little afraid in the neighborhood that I was in. Maybe it's <laughs> because I had listened to that podcast, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe that wasn't the smartest thing for me to I, do. No, no. But uh, there's a lot of things that aren't the smartest thing that I've done, but... <laughs> So thank you, Alexandria Thibodeau. Muchos, thank you. Muchos gracias. Or as you, as they say in French, merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci buckets, as my dad used to say. <sighs> yeah, dad jokes. Mm-hmm. So thank you again to Irene Briand for another uh, little bit of cashola. Much I, appreciated, thank Irene. Thank you so much. And uh, also, here's one. That looks like it might be from somebody who is Scandinavian because they sent it in Swedish kroner. Oh, I'm assuming there's going to be a very easy to pronounce name to him. It's Bo Hellström. Oh, okay. It's not bad. All right. No, it Bo. Was, it, I was actually uh, uh, thinking that it was probably going to be something harder too, but uh, no. Bo. Thank you, Bo, for sending us some uh, some Swedish dough. Yeah, whoa, we bowl will, with the Swedish dough. Maybe we'll go to Ikea and get some uh, Swedish meatballs with it. Do they still have those there? I think so, but I, I typically get their uh, uh, fish and chips. You get fish and chips at? Uh, Ikea, yes, I do. Why do you and do I that? And I enjoy them. I don't think so I've there. ever had fish and chips at... I'm it's not, they're, not, they're not bad for the 12 cents they cost or whatever the hell it is. I'm you do have you do have to assemble them yourself, though. Oh, I'm spoiled for fish and chips being from Nova Scotia. So. Oh God, I bet. Yeah, yeah. I want to take you and Joanna and the kids to uh, the fish shack in Lunenburg someday. Oh God, yes. That's the place that everybody waits in line at lunchtime for fish. Oh and really? Chips. Oh yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Oh, that would be amazing. And the view is beautiful. You get to sit looking at the blue nose and. The uh, golf course beyond and the harbor and all the fishing boats coming and going. It's it's fantastic. Damn, that sounds amazing. It really does. So thank you so much to our patrons, past and present, for your pledges. We really appreciate your support of the show. Very much. Thank you so much for the donut money. If you want to help support us, you can do so at patreon.com slash dark protein or for a one-time support. You can send us donut money via PayPal at our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. Did I just cut out for you? Yeah, for, for a second, yeah. Yeah. 
If you want to help support the show, you can do so at Patreon slash dark patreon.com slash dark poutine, or for one time support, you can send us some donut money via PayPal at our email address, dark poutine podcast at gmail.com. If you don't already, it would mean a lot to us. If you subscribe to the show, you can easily find us on iTunes, podcast, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever you get your on-demand audio. You can easily rate us on Podchaser. It's like IMDb for podcasts. Check out our website, darkpoutine.com, for show notes and other cool stuff. Please give us a follow or a like on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Dark Poutine. Most importantly, thank you for listening. Tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And a little disclaimer at the end of this one, wash your hands. Don't touch your face. <laughs> yes. Stay away from people. Social distance, six feet. Please stay safe and uh, healthy. We love you folks. We certainly do. Don't uh, don't get sick. Please, stay safe. Please don't. Please stay safe, yes. Don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.